Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour webcast from WhiskeyCast.com for a Friday afternoon, the last Friday of February. Springtime's almost here. Saw my first flower of the uh, springtime the other day, walking the dog, a little uh, crocus that had popped up uh, in between all the uh, dead grass and uh, brown stuff out there and uh, the melting snow. So springtime is not that far away. And I uh, hope you've had a good week as well. We're going to have a lot of fun over the next hour, a little over an hour or so, depending on uh, your comments and participation. You can always uh, throw your comments into the uh, question areas and the chat areas on YouTube and on our Facebook page. If you're watching on Periscope, we welcome your comments as well. If you're watching on Twitter, uh, don't respond to the tweet with this video in it because we won't see it till after the show. Uh, by the way, I should warn you that if you are watching on Twitter or Periscope, if you've not heard by now, Periscope will be going away at the end of next month, and we are looking at some options, and uh, I'm trying to decide whether it's worth uh, setting up a Twitch stream and uh, going on Twitch, and uh, we might do a, a Twitter poll on that in the coming days to see how many of you are involved on Twitch and would want to watch on Twitch if we did offer that option. But uh, for now, we're going to be on Twitter and Periscope for at least the next couple of three weeks. And uh, just a heads up for next week, I'll be joined by Uncle Nearest Spawn Weaver and Master Blender Victoria Edie Butler. Victoria was just named one of the Icon of Whiskey Award winner in America for uh, Master Blender of the Year. And uh, an amazing award considering that she's only been doing it for a couple of years now after retiring following a long career in federal law enforcement. Uh, she, of course, is a descendant of uh, Nathan Nearest Green and uh, inherited some of the uh, family aptitude for whiskey, I believe. But uh, Fawn and Victoria will be joining us next week on the Happy Hour webcast at 5 o'clock. In the meantime, we are joined today by our good friends Kevin O'Gorman and Stuart Buchanan. Kevin is the master distiller at Middleton in Ireland. Stuart Buchanan, the global brand ambassador for Ben Riach and Glen Dronach Scotch whiskies, along with Glen Glassock, with the Brown Foreman family over in Scotland, and the former production manager at Ben Riach as well. So he's worked uh, both sides of the uh, whiskey uh, aisle, as it were. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? Doing good. Doing very good. Yeah, it's great. We have uh, we have uh, whiskeys in front of us uh, that both of you guys have been responsible for. Um, Stuart, let's start off with your uh, Ben Rioch Twenty One. Uh, you were not at the were you at the distillery when this was distilled twenty one years ago? No, no. And actually, we're having to dive back into the kind of archives a little here for this twenty one. Uh, the distillery had a kind of silent period from 2000 until 2002, and, and that's when, uh, sorry, 2002 to 2004. And it was 2004 that we really uh, brought the distillery back to life as, as it is today. So this is dipping back into the, the old production under under um, Perro Carter, Sheriff's brother. So, um, yeah, a little bit of history, actually, in this glass. And tell us about some of that history, because... Uh... It's an interesting distillery, and as you point out, it had more than its share of shutdowns over the years, right? It did, it did. And we were chatting the other day about the, the kind of super premium range we have. And I think Ben Rioch really reflects the, let's call it the eras of whiskey uh, through the centuries, in fact, you know, not even just decades. I think every kind of boom and bust that the, the industry has gone through, Ben Rioch has really been touched by and shaped by that, uh, right back to the, the Patterson crash, closing it in, in 1900. And then the, the golden era of whiskey in the 1960s reopening, basically to feed the thirst of the, the American consumer for blended whiskies, which at that time was that lovely, sweet, forward nature of, of, of blend. And, and Ben Rio was a big part of that. Um, and it wasn't maybe until 2004 that we really launched the distillery's core expressions in the single malt range, um, which we, we have always progressed until we get here today. But also very, very strangely, this one particularly, that lovely smoke, so very unusual to get that peated layer running through a Speyside whiskey. And again, we were just fortunate that the distillers before us uh, knew Ben Riach had very broad shoulders and could put a lot of weight on it, whether it was a triple distillation, whether it was a peat, or, and also giving you the classic. We've got a great history of all three styles of production at Ben Riach. And uh, Kevin? <sighs> 
<laughs> this goes without saying, um, your first release of Middleton Very Rare with your signature very elegant here on the front bottle. After years with uh, Barry Crockett and a few years of uh, Brian Nation, who I heard from today, getting ready to move over to Minnesota for his new job in Minneapolis. But uh, tell us about the Middleton Very Rare and your first one. Yeah, it's... Um... It's it's a big big moment. Uh, last week, um, Mark, when we when we launched the uh, Middleton Rare Twenty One, um, we had a great um, a great event in in, in Middleton in Warehouse uh, A Two, which is a, a very special warehouse for me in Middleton. But yeah, it's 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 an honor and a privilege. It's um, it was a huge occasion last week, um, and um, you know I started working on it last last July really in Middleton and uh, putting all the samples together and going through lots of samples in Middleton and eventually coming up with um, the one I decided on uh, last probably November. Um, so I'm really, really happy with it. Um, and, you know, um, over the last few weeks, I've spoken to to Barry a number of times, I've spoken to, to Brian and uh, I'll chuff for me as well and thrilled. And um, it's, it's a true honor. Um, to be honest, it, it really is. Um, so I, I, I'm delighted. And I got a great response as well and, and great support. So yeah, it's great. Um, so that's what I have in front of me tonight. Slancha, and uh, Slancha. I have to ask, Kevin, what did you think when you saw the bottle for the first time, the label with your signature on it, when you got the first look at it? Yeah, it was about um, maybe three weeks ago, maybe two, two, two and a half weeks ago. Um, D Dylan and Kieran um, on the uh, on the marketing team they 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 uh, presented me with the the first bottle uh, it was actually in Middleton in the Hertz Center and um, yeah it was my first time you know seeing the the label and uh, it was it was you know kind of emotional um, you'd be kind of taken aback um, it was it was a very proud moment I have to say it was it was it really was uh, you have to. I suppose pinch yourself um, that you know your, your name is on the bottle. Uh, a lot of history going back to 1825 and the Middleton very rare going back to 1984. Um, so it was it was it was very special and um, yeah, I I, uh, I actually gave the the first bottle to uh, to my to my mother. She was 90 years of age there a few weeks ago, so she got the she got my very first oh, bottle. Wow. So yeah, so that was that was a birthday present for her. Very nice, very nice indeed. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, where's the most unusual place that you've ever found a bottle of whiskey that you helped make? Well, that do you know what? Just thinking there, I think people even forget how personal whiskey is to to the people who make it. You know, I've touched it along its way, um, and I I was surprised myself that I had actually forgotten a little bit when uh, I was managing Ben Riach when we launched the new ten year old and twelve year old series here. That it wasn't to look to the cast makeup. And I saw the AYS, the actual year of the spirit we made, that was under my my ownership, my custodianship, let's say. So that was a, it caught me by surprise, but it was still quite, you know, goosebumps even thinking about it now. So, again, I think it's a hugely personal thing. And even watching cast mature and develop, you know, you, you they do become personal. They're very close to you. And I joked, actually, I used to see cast leaving that would go for single bottlings. I would be crying because I'd looked at that cast over best part of 14, 15 years. So, yeah, that's a nice wee touch. Um, but, yeah, you know. Looked you know, at it and sampled, up. right? Yeah, yeah, yes. It, yeah. There's a larger <laughs> angel share in our warehouse, actually, for some reason when I was uh, looking after the warehouses. But, <laughs> but we've, met, we've met each other all over the world as well, Mark. And um, yeah. it's great to travel and see your whiskey on a shelf or people enjoying it more so, actually, uh, across the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we have a comment already, a question actually from Dave Kuhn. Should I drink cask strength Blair Athol or cask strength Springbank? Yes. Both, <laughs> I think. Might as well drink them both. If you've got them, drink them both. Uh, and I see Matt agrees with me. Uh, we have, uh, okay. Dave asks also for both of you, have either of you been talking with someone in a uh, public setting drinking whiskey you made that you made and surprised them when you said i made this stuff uh, well i'll jump off there i spend most of my time in hotels and hotel bars it wouldn't surprise you um and and again sometimes i've i think i was in where was it it was up in north of florida uh 
Oh, goodness, can't remember. But I was sitting in the bar after doing some work. I'd ordered a dram, pouring a dram. And, you know, I think I think the great thing with, with whiskey is it's always very intriguing because people will look over and you start a conversation straight away almost because they're intrigued with what you have in your glass. So this conversation started up and I was drinking the old 10-year-old bin with a curiositas. And he goes, oh, I can smell that smoke from here. He ordered one, chatting away, waxing lyrical. Then when I told him I made it, he, was, he almost fell off his uh, bar stool. But um, it was great to see him enjoy it so much. So I could tell you many, many more occasions, but that's one that sticks in my head. Kevin? Yeah, um, it, it, it happens uh, quite a lot. But um, again, on travels, uh, as George says, I, I remember a number of years ago, um, I was on a trip to Chicago. It was probably for a whiskey, whiskey, uh, whiskey festival. And um, uh, I was traveling with one of my colleagues. And we just arrived in Chicago. Um, and we went down to the the bar as you would um and i just arrived and there was a guy just on his own at the bar just down for me and quite honestly the the whiskey he ordered was jemison with ice and that was honestly and i was there isn't this amazing i've just landed the first pair I've come into, and this guy orders a gym and some ice. And I remember actually going down, actually, I, I bought him the whiskey, and uh, we had a chat. Now, he couldn't believe it either. This guy was from middle of the distillery, and that really stands out, amazed. And, um, yeah, that, that, that probably is the one that stands out back in Chicago many years ago. The, the funny thing with myself, I'm sure you know, Mark, I wear the kilt a lot. So even if I've finished work and I'm in a, a bar, I've normally got the kilt on, which normally starts out a wee dram session anyway with whoever's around me. So that's always a nice wee thing. <laughs> and I think one of your colleagues uh, piped in there, Stuart. I think they call it, Brendan says, we actually call it the Stuart's share at Benriac, <laughs> not the he Angel's knows, share. He knows the cast I looked after, yes, yes. <laughs> Hey, Paul, Tosh McGill call. is joining us from uh, New Zealand and says one of her favorite memories is a late night lock-in in New Zealand with Stuart pulling bottles off the shelf. Do you remember that one, Stuart? I do. And I, I, well, just to touch on New Zealand, actually, the last time I was abroad was our trip to, to Christchurch for a whiskey fest, a uh, dram fest. This there. time last year. Yeah, it was. And almost just got flown out of Sydney the week after the festival. Itself. So many, many uh, good occasions down in the the Southern Hemisphere, let's say. Don't remember them all, but um, <laughs> very, and that's probably because of the whiskey, but very enjoyable. No, it's not because of the people, of course. The people are amazing down there. <laughs> they are very hospitable. But that's really the case all over, isn't it? Uh, whiskey people are some of the just most pleasant people to be around when you're talking with whiskey nerds. I mean, we can agree to disagree on a lot of things on politics, on sports teams and things like that. But most of the time, we can pretty much find common ground when it comes to whiskeys. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely, Mark. And, you know, uh, over the last few months, you know, what I miss a lot um, is because of the lockdown here in Ireland. And I'm sure it's the same everywhere else is just meeting people, particularly with product launches over the last few months. We had last week with the MVR. Then we had, you know, Blue Spot uh, before Christmas. And um, it's a great, a great chance to, I suppose, meet people, um, have a drop, get people's opinions, have a great interaction. We had some great nights, uh, but I, I really miss that. But you're right. It's, it's a great community, um, wonderful people, um, and we all get on so well. Uh, but I, I can't wait to get back to Whiskey Live, Whiskey Fest. Um, and, you know, it's gas. Some years ago, you'd be kind of doing a lot of travel and you might kind of give out about it and, you know, uh, but it's gas after a, a year of lockdown. Um, I, I'm really actually looking forward to getting back out there and, and meeting people again. And, you know, I suppose presenting what we do and, you know, showcasing what we do and talking about whiskey and, um, yeah, virtual is great and we, we have to make, make the best of what we have. But the, I suppose the personal touch and meeting people, I, I, I really do miss that, you know. You mentioned Blue Spot. I will tell you that I've been trying to track down some <laughs> in the States, and I must have called around to at least 10 different stores in the Northeast U.S. last night yeah. within driving distance just to see who might have it. And then I look in the uh, website for the Pennsylvania State stores through their Fine Wine and Good Spirits shop, they had something like a couple of their stores had six bottles listed as an inventory 
but that was as of the night before. I called and they said, nope, we sold it out last one an hour ago. Are you oh, surprised dear. by how quickly that thing is sold out? Yeah, well, look, I'll make you really jealous. Look, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I still have my sample from the last tasting upstairs. Ah, uh, there you go. I have about uh, half of that left. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm not surprised. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very special whiskey. Um, we were delighted to put all the colors back together again. Um, and after, I think it was like maybe 55 or 56 years, uh, the last time all these spots were together, um, you know, you green, uh, yellow, blue, and red. Uh, so really last November, when we did the launch of Blue Spot, just to bring the whole family back together again, uh, that, that was really special. Um, it's, 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 it's a great whiskey. Um, I know you have an age statement of seven years on it, but you know, we've whiskeys in Madeira uh, cast up to 20 years old. Um, so it's, it really, it, it really is, it's fantastic. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's great to have them all back together again. And Stuart talking about Madeira for a second, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, the 25, the new 25 year old Ben Riach has Madeira cask in it, right? It has, it has. And, and, and Madeira is one of my favorite cast maturation styles, full stop. It, it, it fits in with my, my, my sweet tooth, my fruit forward tooth, you know, excuse me a second. <coughs> And even going back to 2004, you know, that Renaissance period I talk about and, you know, going into the woods uh, a bit deeper than, than maybe just American or, or the sherry. Uh, I always thought Madeira was outstanding, especially with, again, the synergy of the, the cask and the spirit. You know, Benria has got that apple, pear, fruit forward nature. Well, the apricot notes, they work in perfect harmony together. They, they just balance so well. They never, do, no one thing dominates. And uh, I just love that luscious fruit note, that really ripened fruit note you get from it. Beautiful mm -hmm. cask. And I know, Kevin, you've worked with Madeira casks in your previous role as Master of Maturation, overseeing uh, all of the barrel selections for Middleton. Tell me about what Madeira adds to Irish whiskey. Yeah, I suppose if you take the the, the blue spot, um, and we've been working on Madeira casks for, for a long time now. My predecessor, Br Brenda Monks, would have set up the original contacts with Enrique and Enrique in, 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 in Madeira. Um, and... Uh, I, you know, we had some 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 great trips out there. It's a wonderful island. Um, very proud of their wine making history. Um, so it's it's a very special place. So we, we take the cast over. We started probably working on Madeira, well, you know, well over twenty years ago. Um, but I think uh, because of the the flavour of the wine, um, it just works really really well uh, with with the single pot still. Um, so great flavors. I think Stuart has mentioned there sort of the, the fruit, um, sort of stewed apple, uh, stewed fruits, um, so rich. Um, but at the same time, then you have sort of the, the vanilla and the toffee and everything comes true on, on the blue spot. Um, so I, I, you know, they're a great cast to work with. I have great memories um, working with the guys in Madeira. Um, and um, I suppose if you look at the extension then of, of the spot range, if you know, like Marsala again is a very, very special place in Sicily to visit. And the Marsala casts offer so much, um, so, some similarities in terms of the, 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 the aromas and the fruits and the depth of flavor. Um, but again, it's just, there's just some subtle differences as well. Uh, but they're, they're great um, fortified wines. Um, and, you know, you have the you have Oloroso Sherry, you have the Port, but my God, Madeira and uh, Marsala have something very special to offer. that They really do. And Graham Frazier is asking from the UK, how do you get a bottle of the new Middleton Very Rare, Kevin? Um, well, if you're in the UK, you have to wait a little while, right? Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's going to be heading over there. I, I don't have the exact dates, but I, I would say very soon. Um, I think uh, some bottles have already got made their way over to Japan. I think uh, I've seen something on Instagram or something that bottles have made their way over there already. And they're on the way to the States, um, Canada, France, Germany, and obviously, you know, global uh, travel retail when it, when it opens up. But um, so, yeah, if, if it's a bit of patience, they'll, they'll, they'll make their way over there and uh, it'll, it'll be great. I, um, you'll enjoy it. And I can't wait till uh, travel opens up again and you can head over to uh, Dublin Airport to the Irish Whiskey Collection shop. And uh, I imagine they'll have these and you can say, yeah, that's that's on my signature on there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuart, you, uh, we talked about the Ben Riach 25 and the 21. Uh, Donner Pass Whiskey loved the original Ben Riach 12 pre the rebranding that you've gone to now. Has it changed in the new packaging? Did the, I know that the 12, you did a 
the 12, the original 12 and the PD 12, right? With the new setup that Rachel's put in place. That's right. That's right. Uh, the, the old 12, do you know what, actually? The, I think um, a lot of times when we actually bring a whiskey to the market, it's sometimes not for global release and it will be maybe very much a, a dead for, for one particular market. And that 12 actually, going right back to its first foundation, was actually a, for Taiwan only. It was a Taiwan exclusive. Um, and then the popularity of it grew and grew and grew. Actually, in the very first year, it won the Independent Wine and Spirits competition, the, the top trophy, which took us by surprise because we didn't even enter into that competition and it just blew the orders through the roof for it. But funnily enough, we didn't we, we didn't have the sherry cast to maintain it or, or keep that that depth of quality to it. You know, we'd have maybe had to go to um, American Oak Combination in there. We wanted to keep that sherry fo- focus. So we did let it go. So we did bring it back into this new range, but Rachel just added that other little layer of flavour using uh, this time in the 12-year-old. We still have the Oloroso, the Pedro Jimenez combination there, but then she's bringing in the port, and the port's just going to just tweak that fruit dynamic. Cherries, it's like this Black Forest Gato, actually. You know, the chocolates and the rich fruit of the PX, that fine line, clean line of the Oloroso. Then almost almost cherries and orange from, from the port there. So, oh, beautiful layered uh, character. But, yeah, still very much sherry-focused, just the addition of the, the, the port coming in on top. And, Kevin, you had the port played the role in the uh, Red Dress 27 that came out uh, last spring, almost a year ago. Yeah, it's a year ago, uh, March, early March. I think it was March the 4th last year uh, before everything changed. So, um, yeah, it was... Um, we, we were, I think we'd planned to do something in, uh, up the Douro uh, in Oporto, and uh, that changed. And then we, we, we basically had the, the launch in Dublin, and everything changed after that. But, uh, yeah, a wonderful event, and Redbreast 27, the use of the port. And as Stuart says, I mean, that, that fruit, um, berries, plums, uh, the, oh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and it's, it's just a great piece of work, the Redbreast 27. Uh, it really is um, I, I think, and again, the the whole region uh, of Porto and the Douro Valley, uh, and the, the the you know the the history there, uh, I I just think it's a wonderful place, um, and the sourcing of the cast, and with some great visits out there, uh, myself, Billy Lighton, and you know it's 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 a great place to visit. Uh, if people haven't gone on holidays to uh, a Porto, they they really should uh, get get out there a few times. It's 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 wonderful, but yeah, I I I love port casts. Um, I love the port contribution. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a great whiskey, wonderful. They're, they're the are fantastic to work with. I'm sorry, go ahead, Stuart. I just think they're fantastic to work with. Funny enough, we um, the, the, the port is funny with peat, you know, because the large port ruby port pipes it can give some great interaction, but maybe the peat will start to 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 fade there because of the richness of the port. So we've we've got a nice combination of tawny hogsheads and the ruby port pipes. So we can even play around with bringing both of those together. Maybe getting that fresher, more smoky line from the hogsheads, from the tawny, but still give us the big fruits from the, the ruby there as well. So it's nice to have that flexibility to, to bring them both together. Mm. Excuse me just a second. Had a question that Paul Williams has for me. Asked if I'm going to be at the Whiskey Show in London in October. I sure hope so. Um, if I'm vaccinated by then and it's safe to travel and we don't have to quarantine for 14 days before uh, the show... Yeah, I would love to try to be there. That's the, uh, realistically, about as early as I would expect to even think about being able to travel overseas would be sometime in in early October. Uh, before then, I don't anticipate uh, traveling much at all. Have you guys been given any guidance by uh, corporate on when they're going to let you travel again? Now, for us, it's going to be, it's going to be a significant period of time, Mark. Um, you know, we don't have any target dates or anything like that but uh, you're talking quite a significant period of time so at, at the moment here in Ireland just to give you a flavor I suppose we're on level five lockdown um, which basically means you know schools are still closed uh, obviously all pubs restaurants all all closed um, so it's a pretty you know uh, stringent uh, lockdown here um, and you know it was announced you know a week ago that that's going to continue right up to April the fifth at least, and it'll be reviewed then. So, we're, you know we're in a very very tight lockdown, and look, it's it's that, that that's the that, that's the guidelines. Um, so you're talking about you know a, a long time, I'd say, Mark, before we would be back flying again. 
You're right. And I think, I think, you know, good. There, there probably was a best case scenario before the second spike that we would have even thought we would maybe be traveling again by now. Because I know we were looking at maybe possibilities of April before that second spike. But you're right. Mm. The good thing is vaccinations are rolling out strong, you know, um, whether that then sees numbers change. And um, yeah, we can go forward from there. But I, London, I don't know if that was my colleague, Paul Williams, or another Paul Williams, but we've actually got plans for London already and, and we're moving ahead with, with being there. Uh, one of the most fantastic stands actually covering the malts and the American whiskies. Uh, so that's going to be really a nice prominent position uh, in London. So looking forward to it. If we get there, fingers crossed. <laughs> if we get there. I mean, I, I hope we get to it soon, but I don't want to rush it. And I'm not going anywhere before I get a chance to get vaccinated. I just, I'm not even going to take the chance because, uh, I've been lucky so far to avoid it, and I hope it stays that way because, uh, as you guys well know, one of the problems with this virus is that you blow out your sense of smell and taste, and God help us if we do that in this business. Absolutely, yeah. That I mean, that's crossed my mind a number of times over the last, uh, you know, 12 months. Um, it certainly has a, it can have an impact on your, on your taste, and uh, that wouldn't be very good. So, um, again, I, I'm fortunate as well, have, have avoided that. Um, so yeah, you, you, you know, we have to be careful and, uh, that's, that's probably the last thing that, uh, something like that, uh, affect your taste buds. That wouldn't be good. No, you're right. And actually I had a colleague in Poland, one of our ambassadors there who, who actually saw that as the first sign of him having it. So it was yeah. a great telltale sign that, that that was him, you know, coming into, but he said, I thought as well, you know, do you lose just a little bit? But he said, no, boom, totally gone, totally gone. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, oh Yeah. Nope. Every morning I wake up and I do a quick check. I walk downstairs and if I can smell the cat box, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Charles Epperson had a fun comment here. Um, I will only make a proper Irish coffee using red breast. No other Irish whiskey will do. Well, yeah, I can certainly see that, although I think the original Irish whiskeys were made with powers. Am I correct in that, Kevin? Yeah, Powers would be a kind of a favorite with, um, you know, uh, Irish coffees traditionally. Uh, in fact, when I, when I do Irish coffees here at home, myself and, and my wife, we, we'd, we'd still use Powers. That, uh, you know, sort of rich pot still uh, and just the flavor of the Powers is, 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 is really nice. Uh, but Redbreast, yeah, absolutely good choice as well. Um, but uh, maybe he should try Powers maybe sometime. And uh, I know Powers is available over in the States there. So it'd be worth checking out the Powers maybe on the, the Irish coffee. Be a little less expensive to do an Irish coffee with Powers than Red Breast too as well. Yes, um, a little bit. Watchman999 yeah. asks, is Catbox a tasting note? Not a tasting note, but a nose note. Yeah, I mean, there because there is actually an ammonia smell that some winemakers use or will describe, uh, like an ammonia or smell that smells sort of like a cat box. I remember uh, years ago in Whiskey Magazine, Arthur Motley made a reference to a cat box or cat urine in a tasting note for a Wild Scotsman Scotch whiskey. And uh, Jeffrey Topping, the guy who runs Wild Scotsman, the founder there, uh, just about went ballistic when he read the tasting notes for that. And saw a note of, uh, cat, of cat urine in my whiskey. I don't bleep and think so. Um, and, uh, Dave Kuhn says only in Glen Livet. Be nice, Dave. Come on. Um, Tyrone Cote, our pal in Nova Scotia loves black bush for Irish coffee. That's a good one. Um, and Sergio's Floridas at uh, Irish whiskey magazine. I've been using Middleton Pearl for <laughs> Irish coffee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, Richard Dankovic says, if you're living large, try an Irish coffee with red spot. That would be good too, I think. Mm -hmm. The uh, and Crumpler, yep. Cat urine, common note in double IPAs and Nurse Dave in a Sauvignon Blanc, not unusual. Yep, it's there, but fortunately, it's not in whiskeys very much. Um, let's talk about uh, peat for a second here. Dave Kuhn has a question for you, Stuart. How would you describe the peated character of the Ben Riac? And uh, let's talk about the floor maltings there too, because you're doing your own peated malt on site, right? Um, well, historically, that was uh, uh, the peat would have been produced at the maltings. I will say we the maltings ran for 100 years, 1898 to 1998. And then actually, it was one of the last jobs I had in production was getting that fit for proper skin. 
we haven't actually started peating there yet because we've done um, seasonal maybe six weeks since 2012, but we've really been conscious in getting, getting it right and, and seeing that maturation. I would love to start doing the peat there again. Uh, at the moment, we could do bring our peat in from uh, Crisp, which is only just down okay. the road in uh, Port Gordon. And they do not use the Highland peat. So I just happen to have, if I can grab this a second, uh, the, the, the new Pitts Ligo peat here. Um, and I think what you can see, if I can hold this a little bit closer, just that beautiful vegetation matter that we still have intact there. You know, there's still that old garnet matter intact. And if you were to burn that, it's like apple wood smoke is the best way I could put it, I suppose. You know, so when you know the any Benriach, you don't get the iodine. You don't get that a typical uh, coastal influence of maybe the Isla Malt. You, you get wood smoke. You get barbecue. That, for me, is there. And that's what Rachel then can do across the range is, is take some classic whiskey uh, matured as well as repeated and then actually tweak that with combina- combining both to, f- to feel where she wants that to come across. And it's an amazing journey with, with Highland Peak particularly because it never dominates. Sometimes it doesn't c- come into the palate until maybe 10, 12 seconds, and it just can, comes in and gives you a hug, then goes away again. So that's just that art of, match- of master blending anyway to make that happen and, and to bring it in the right way. It's, it's amazing art and really fun when you get that pop of peat in the, in the palate. Kevin, tell me about uh, the reasons why we don't see much peat in Irish whiskey, because obviously there's a lot of peat in Ireland and it is used for heating, but uh, you guys found more important uses for it than uh, doing the barley for whiskey, right? Yeah, but I mean, if you go back, um, you know, 100 years or more, then, then you know, you would have been using peat um, uh, because there's a, a huge availability of, of peat in Ireland, as, as, as you know. But I suppose then things changed and really, I suppose, uh, over the last, what, 45, 50 years, um, the use of peat really, you know, has, has you know, faded out. Um, so there is some examples of, of, of peated whiskies in Ireland, just a small number. Uh, but it's something that we don't do uh, in Middleton. They haven't done for probably 50 years or so. Um, I know the chapter one of the, um, the silent distillery uh, which was, you know, some of the, the the last stock of the old distillery in Middleton uh, had some some uh, you know a, a nice touch of of peat, uh, but that would have been the last of it. So um, I suppose that that bottling, the chapter one, was very 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 special in the sense that it was you know some of the old distillate from the old distillery uh, in Middleton. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose look, there is some examples now of of peated uh, peated whiskies coming back uh, in some shape and form. Um, um, and you know maybe you'll see more in the years ahead, but it's, it's something that we, we 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 don't do in Middleton. Um, but you never know what could happen in the future. We 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 could try it again, but uh, no no media plans. Mm. Yeah, I and, that would be interesting to watch. I would love to see Billy work on a peated whiskey. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be that would be a good challenge for him. Yeah, he'd love that. Yeah. I but think let's talk about what you do. In the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying. I think a lot of people think about smoke in a different way or peat because there's so many things you can do in production that you can really make personal to your distillery as well. You know, so it's not just about this smokiness that, that people are maybe have in their head that, that's a perception of an island of taste. And you can really take that, Pete, and, and through your production, really start to change it in some ways, whether it's through your, your fermentation stage, your, your middle cut. It's a huge, um, you know, huge influence of, of peat phenols that you can take your cut a little bit here or a little bit there to, to then push or... or push back so there's a lot of things you can do in production which really personalize that peat to to your distillery and that's that's one of the fascinations for peat for me it's not just a layer of smoke there's so many things you can do cast size small cast big cast whatever lovely wee things you can do kevin one of the other things you don't have uh, that you you don't use peat but one of the things you've been doing a lot more with lately is irish shoke in the derrick whale ox series Let's talk about that one because it really is an attempt to bring back Irish oak. And I know that there's three editions out so far, and all of these have been stunning. But explain the whole Derek Wailach project. Yeah, so the whole project, um, we started off, golly, it must be probably 2007, maybe 2008, um, which is a long time ago now. Uh, You know, we looked at the whole... um, concept of looking at uh, or using Irish oak um, and I suppose you know the history of Irish oak is is, 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 is very very 
interesting. Um, if you go back to, it's probably the 1400s, 1500s, you know, uh, Ireland was, was covered in hardwoods and oak would have been one of those. Uh, and then over, you know, many centuries, uh, it was it was harvested. Uh, and eventually, uh, in the early 1900s, it was down to about 1% land cover, uh, forest cover in Ireland, 1%, which is just it was just terrible it was awful what happened uh it was all it was all cut down for for various reasons um but um you know that was a pity now over, over sort of from the early sort of 1900s um you know things started to improve gradually and then i suppose joining the european union or the ec at the time um there was even more emphasis on on on, on improving forestation in ireland um, lots of grants um, and the government stepped in and, uh, you know, those subsidies and grants were really important for farmers to, to move over and shift to, to, to forestry. Um, and then we've our National Forestry Service, Quilcha, who, who, you know, who do a lot of work as well in, in, in improving forestry cover. So we're back up to around uh, 11, between 11 and 12% uh, cover now at the moment. So it was in the backdrop of that uh, back in 2007 that we sort of did a bit of investigation. Uh, and we started working with a forester called Petty Purser in Ireland, uh, who was a renowned forester. Um, and then we started doing a, a few small trials um, using small uh, barrels with Irish oak to see what the flavor impact would be. Um, and that was that was very interesting. Um, and we really liked the flavor profile. Um, and so then we started, you know, I suppose, reaching out to individual estate owners in Ireland who had a significant amount of oak available. And uh, the first estate was uh, Grinsell's Wood in Balatoban with Mickey Gabbett. And that was our first estate. Um, and we harvested the trees. Um, I think we knocked about maybe 10, fell about 10 trees that time. Then we send those logs over to, to Spain, uh, to Barala, where we, we, where we get them um, you know, uh, quarter sawn into staves. Those staves are sent down to Jaretta Frontera to our friends in Antonio Pais Cooperage. Uh, and then after about 15 months drying, uh, the Irish oak staves are manufactured into hogshead casts. Uh, and then we bring those back to Ireland. Um, they get a kind of a, a light to medium toast. The first batch we did got a, a medium toast, which was probably a little bit heavy. So we reduced the toast over the years. Uh, so we went back to Ireland and then we filled those casks with um, a selection of uh, single pot still whiskies uh, of various ages. Um, on average, it could be sort of 15 to 25 years old um, single pot stills. Uh, and then we finish it in those Irish oak for maybe a year, maybe two years, uh, depending on the on the cast and how the whiskey is performing. Um, and then we uh, have our single estate, you know, um, uh, individual farmer uh, with um, uh, cast strength um, single pot still uh, finished in Irish oak and as you know Mark the flavour is wonderful um, it's very rich chocolate toffee coffee um, you know but at the same time the pot still with the spices is still there so the whole thing is still in harmony and um, you know the, the finishing time is crucial and trying to make sure you still have that balance you don't want to leave it there too long because the, the oak is going to overpower it. Uh, you don't want to leave it too sharp because you don't have enough oak. So the, there's a sweet spot there that we really keep an eye on and, and do a lot of tasting. Um, and then I suppose to, to, to the whole project was um, very important from the point of view that we trace each tree so that every bottle that you buy of Middleton Dark Whalock, you can trace it back to a tree number. Um, so for example, in the, the most recent you know, uh, you, have, you have, you know, tree number one, two, three, and four, and, and so on. And people can look at their bottle and they can actually relate it back to a tree number. So really in terms of traceability, it's probably the ultimate in traceability in terms of maturation and wood. Um, it was very challenging at the time uh, to do all that, but now we're kind of, we've, we've systems up and running. Um, so that's kind of the the, the history of, of Dark Whalock. And um, it's, it's, it's great now because, um, you know, the farmers that we work with are so, interested in sustainability. They're so enthusiastic. They're so uh, driven by looking after their forests. Um, so the second edition was Bluebell and Kikini. And then the third edition was Knockrath in Wicklow, working with the Brabazon family. And all these families are just wonderful. And um, I, I, you know, I've learned so much just working with Paddy Purse of the Forester, 
working with the farmers, uh, the replanting that we have to do. So every tree that we fell, we'd eight to 10 saplings, and then we'd see those grow and develop. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a great project. Uh, release four is, we actually tasted it two weeks ago, um, Dave McCabe and, and, and myself, and it's coming on really nicely. You'd be glad to hear, Mark. And um, so, yeah, hopefully in the next sort of coming few months, uh, you, you'll see uh, the next, next release of Middle to Dark Wailock, and uh, it's something to look forward to. I can't wait because uh, I have loved all three of the Dark Wailocks so far. Uh, Stuart, we have a question for you from Chris Radcliffe. What's it like working as a, at a distillery as ownership changes? How does it affect those in production and evangelizing the brand? And how does it change the energy of a distillery? Uh, obviously, Brown Foreman acquired Ben Riak, Glenn Dronick, and Glenn Glassock from Billy Walker and his partners several years ago. And you were around for all that. How does a uh, management change affect a distillery? Very little, and uh, you know, back at back at kind of a, a grassroots level at the distillery itself. You know, there's there's not been any change uh, whatsoever in, in 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 production levels or or, or cask. Well, I'm saying that cask coming in definitely because we're now instead of phoning up the space side cooperage, we just phone up Louisville, for example, and get our cask direct from the U.S. distillers uh, in Brown Foreman. Uh, even our Virgin Oaks uh, using the Alabama cooperage and the Louisville co cooperage, uh, getting bespoke toastings there, which maybe we couldn't have done before from from uh, Space Out cooperage. So, the, the, yeah, some great stuff there. But as far as uh, anything else, nothing much has changed on the ground. I think what I've seen is that bigger reach and, and maybe more concentration in the U.S. The U.S. was a market historically that we did go into. We tiptoed in there and did some of the shows. But uh, the drive in the U.S., particularly if the U.S. consumer, has really uh, gone gone big in the last, uh, what is almost now five years with Brown Foreman. And and we're doing really well. you really well. So I've really enjoyed my time in the U.S. And I don't know about yourself just talking about the U.S. there, but I don't know. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with U.S. with whiskey societies single malt sorry american whiskey societies who actually want more uh, of the, the scottish knowledge so i don't know if even the, the american consumer over this lockdown period has has maybe started to broach into different styles of whiskey that maybe he wouldn't have done or she wouldn't have done historically so i think um, single malts and, and whiskies in general have been yeah they've, they've survived quite well through these times i believe well, they have, except for the tariffs. The uh, tariffs have taken a big bite out of the stuff you guys have been sending over. I know single malt sales have uh, imports to, from Scotland have dropped off dramatically. And fortunately, uh, Kevin's folks aren't subject to those tariffs. So it, it has, uh, I think it's probably benefited Irish whiskey a little bit and probably helped American whiskey more than it has uh, really helped Scotch whiskey in terms of sales right now. And I, I'm worried about the future of that because... Uh, a lot of folks are being priced out of the Scotch whiskey market because of these tariffs. And uh, I'm afraid we're not going to get much experimentation until, or once the tariffs end, we're not going to get people uh, trying out single malts and really learning to like them as much. And uh, I don't know where we go on that front. Uh, yeah, well, I've been, I think maybe that's one thing we've got a slight um, advantage of is having the, the, the Brown Foreman uh, US um, owned company, uh, so we, we, we've, we've maybe absorbed actually some of that cost. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting time, certainly. And Charles Epperson asks, what is the largest market for Ben Riak and Glendronach? Is it the U.S.? Is it uh, continental Europe? Uh, do you know yet? Uh, yeah, historically, Taiwan was always up there. You know, your top three would be Germany, France and UK. But Taiwan would always be up there. Um, Taiwanese market is absolutely crazy. They, they are just so thirsty for whiskies of all types. Uh, you go to, uh, you go there, and it's yeah, the whiskey is drank in a slightly different way than we would maybe do it here. It's very much the campai down the down the hatch. So there's not much uh, sitting around with your drams there. But uh, for a small country, the, the the always rock number one. It's now shifted. So you, I would say, I, I'm not always looking at the figures, but. U.S. is definitely up there alongside Taiwan in that number one spot. So that's, again, the shift I've seen under Brown Foreman and uh, now moving more weight, I suppose, into the U.S. consumer. Dave, one of the projects that you were instrumental in and actually appeared in the uh, commercials for a few years ago was the uh, the Jameson Caskmates development. And Dave Kuhn asks, has an Irish whiskey ever been aged or finished in a former Guinness Imperial Stout cask? 
I have to imagine there has been, although it's not been officially Guinness casks. But uh, tell us about how you guys worked with the uh, Franciscan well originally down in Cork to, uh, cr- and then later eight degrees, I think, uh, to uh, create the cask mates range. Yeah, so that was um, like all lots of innovation. It was more more excellent than than design. Um, a, a number of years ago, it's probably back to two thousand and twelve, maybe two thousand and thirteen, I guess. Um, Dave Quinn, you know, you know Dave, he's, he's, he's our um, you know technical director in Middleton. Uh, he, he he would be uh, uh, you know he'd be good friends uh, with the, the the head brewer back in Francisco Well uh, back then. And they 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 met up, uh, um, so they they said they'd sort of exchange some some barrels um, because you know Franwell were looking for, for for some of our Jemison barrels to to basically do some work on their on their beers and their stouts. So we would have sent up, um, I think it was about six barrels initially. Uh, that was the first trial. Uh, so we sent up the barrels, and um, Franwell would have done some work on that. They they actually produced the stout at the time. Um, uh, which was which was matured or finished in those barrels, um, and then um, I think they rang up Dave and said, "Look, we have these six barrels here. Uh, what, what what are we going to do with the barrels? Do you want them back?" Uh, so Dave, I think, rang me then and said, "Look, we have the six barrels," and we said, "Look, should we take them back and um, let's 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 put a bit of Jemison into them?" Just and that was, you know, a bit of for the crack really, um, and we, let's see what happens. Um, so we, we left them and then we sampled them after a number of weeks. We were kind of really, really pleasantly surprised with the flavor. Um, so you had those chocolate toffee, pronounced toffee, roasted coffee beans, um, vanilla notes coming through, but not in, it wasn't overpowered. It was there. It was, it was, it was just really, really nice. Um, and we said, wow, this is really good. And really, that's how the project um, kicked off. Um, and then it, it just it escalated from there. Um, uh, and really, the, you know, the, the first edition, which is the stout edition, it's gone down so well. So then after maybe two years, um, we were just looking maybe to do something different and do maybe an extension. Uh, and we tried the um, pale ale then. Um, and again, that's completely different again, because you, you're talking about you know, extra hops and you have the extra citrus, um, uh, sort of zesty flavors. Um, and it, it, it still works very well with the Jemison. Um, you have all the Jemison, the spiciness and the vanilla, and then you have this extra hoppy uh, citrus note, which is really, really nice. So that was the second one. Um, and then, you know, as you know now, eight degrees, we, 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 we have eight degrees, which is actually just maybe about a mile from me here. I'm from Mitchellstown and the brewery is just about a mile out the road here. So it's great. Uh, the guys, I know the guys there, uh, Scott and Cam, the brewers, and they're really great. Innovation, trying different things. Uh, and recently, just before, we had the, the a special version of Crested, Jemison Crested, where we have, um, you know, they had a, they produced a very rich stout called Black Ball, uh, and um, you know we we used the, that stout then to to season those casts, and then we finished crested Jemison crested in those in those barrels to give a really really special crested, and we we you know people loved it. Um, so yeah, again it started by accident, and uh, here we are, you know, eight or nine years later with with uh, with an amazing product. It's uh, I I could I could tell you loads of things that it was really well planned, and we had lots of strategy and all that, but it, that wasn't the case. And if I remember correctly, you guys took that to the marketing folks up in Dublin and said, hey, uh, we sort of did this. Uh, you guys might want to actually do something with this. Yeah. Was that the case? Uh, pretty much. It was. Yeah, it was It was kind of accident. We said, look, we, we really like this. And I think, yeah, we, you know, we sent up some samples and said, uh, you got to, this, this is really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, we got some positive feedback and it took, it took, it took off from there. It was, it was great. And yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a very interesting, I suppose. If people put, you know, your Jemison original, then you put your Jemison Castmate Stout, and then you put your Jemison IPA. It's really worth doing from a tasting exercise, and you can see the progression and the flavor contribution. Uh, it's 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 a really interesting exercise for people if they if they had time to do it some someday. It's really good. Hey, I have to ask uh, the uh, Masters series that came out from Jemison a couple of years ago. Uh, 
Your predecessor, Brian Nation, got to have, I believe, the Distiller's Safe Edition. Are you going to uh, do an updated version of that? Uh, no, <laughs> there's no plans yet, um, Mark. Nothing. No, I, I didn't plan anything yet, but I'm trying to get over this Middleton very rare 21 first. Uh, no, there's no, there's no immediate plans. But <laughs> Because we've got to point out, Billy Layton had the Blender's Dog, and I'm trying to remember what was the thing. And Jared, Jared Buckley Jared, had okay. the Cooper's, Cooper's Crows. Crows. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, so, the, the, the whole idea of that was to focus on specific ac aspects of the Jemison taste and flavor and profile. And uh, there were, you know, the Brian's area was the, you know, distilling and highlighting the distillate. Then you'd Billy with the whole blending and putting something together and then Jer with the wood. So that there were the three areas to, to, to focus on. So it was interesting. Yeah. But I still think you need to do your own take on this one. I liked, well, just, I liked the original three. I think you need to continue it. Okay, well, give me a chance. Give me a chance, Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll get working on that, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Blender Pass Whiskey says, the tariffs suck big time. Miss being able to order from the whiskey exchange. Now it's cost prohibitive. Um, in fact, I was checking last night. The uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin is now not even shipping to the U.S. because they had to ship through Heathrow in London and because of the whole Brexit issue, shipping through London became really a nightmare. So uh, you can't even order from the Celtic whiskey shop and our buddy Ali Alpine in Dublin anymore right now because of Brexit. Um, and the, uh, let's see, uh, Don Watchman 99 points out, uh, whiskey exchange won't even ship to Canada, but those U.S. tariffs need to go. Uh, ben Marnock asks if, Stuart, if you've heard anything about issues getting Ben Riek and Glendronic into the EU, uh, there seem to be some problems for the smaller whiskey companies post Brexit. Uh, that one may be above your pay grade. What have you heard? No, not at all. Actually, we again the thing as well. I think what we did was almost preempt any changes and start working on them two and a half years ago. So Brim Foreman also have an office in uh, Holland, just out, in outside Amsterdam. So we did even two and a half years ago make a wise decision to change some addresses to the Amsterdam office. Now, this is just to see if it would ease things up, make things a bit more uh, fluid. So we had, yeah, worked very closely um, with with the label. Actually, a lot of label designs had to be changed for that, just making th so that we could get things as smooth as possible if they could be come the time. And we did have an issues, but the, the issues weren't particularly in, in moving the whiskey uh, legislationally-wise. It was actually more just to do with the ports being overwhelmed. There was huge overwhelming from the ports across uh, UK and and uh, elsewhere that really maybe did stack up a little bit of backlog. But other than that, we were quite well prepared for it. And Richard Dan Kovic has a question that uh, both of you, uh, it's for Kevin, but I'll pose it to both of you. What are your thoughts on the insanity in secondary market pricing for the MVR 2020, which was Brian's last edition? But I will tell you, last night I saw a uh, bottle of Blue Spot priced at a, I believe, a European retailer for 460 euros a bottle for something that had about an 80 euro list price. Mm. What are your thoughts on the secondary market pricing as distillers and whiskey makers? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the MVR um, 20, which is, you know, as you say, Brian's last, um, yeah, the, the, like, you know, it's commanding, you know, pretty high prices. Um, it's something that it, it kind of disappoints me, Mark, to be honest. I, I As a distiller and a, as a whiskey producer, you know, we have our recommended retail prices. A lot of it is outside of our control, but, you know, I, I, I just... You know, I like to have whiskies accessible for a certain price and people enjoying it. Uh, and this sort of exchanging of whiskies and flipping whiskies, it's 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 disappointing. But it's a lot of it's outside, of, you know, our control. Um, so yeah, look, it's 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 I suppose it's disappointing. I, I don't like to see it. Um, and for me, Middleton very rare. People should, you know, buy a bottle or buy two bottles, enjoy it, keep a bottle, great. But um, you know, flipping them from, from for really high prices is 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 it's it's not it's not for me in a way. Stuart, but on my front, I'm surprised I've got a lip left. I just bite my lip so hard. You know, when you see these things, I'm surprised I've got any lips left. Uh, so yes, it's frustrating. Um, yeah. Recent one there was, I suppose, uh, Ardmurachan. You know, first release there, forty-five pound retail UK price. 
you know, almost 10 times that within a week, you know. And that's one, again, you, you see that, especially with that, that circumstance where it's something that people really want to taste and enjoy, and you know that none of them will get open. That's my frustration. <laughs> Just like yeah. with Toraveg last week, when, when their first release came out. Uh, people went nuts for that one. It was 45 pounds, and it's already sold out, and you can see it already being flipped a week after it came out. Um, I will point out that uh, there are certain whiskeys that don't always get to go everywhere in the world. Um, it pains me every May to see Redbreast Dreamcast never make it to the U.S., <laughs> and I fully understand and know why it can't because of the way it's sold and the limited amounts. But I will point out, U.S. gets the <laughs> red breast cask strength small batch. So, na 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 nah, nah. <laughs> And uh, I kid, of course. But uh, tell me about this one because I know you played a big role in putting this one together too, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Huge credit must go to B Billy uh, Billy Lighton and, and Dave McCabe for this one. Um, they did a great job. Um, it's the second, you know, small oh, batch. It'll edition. just go to their heads. It'll just go to their heads. Uh, no, they they, they that. deserve it. They deserve it. They deserve it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So th they did a lot of work on this one. Um, so what you have here is you have a, I suppose, a single pot still uh, whiskeys um, from, um, first of all, American barrels. I think he did first fills and second fills. And you also have single pot still from um, Sherry Cass. Uh, I think there were second fills. Uh, and it was about between nine and 10 years old. So they, they selected those barrels. They put it all together. And then they finished it, uh, quite a short finish, in first fill Oloroso uh, Sherry Cass. And it was like, um, I suppose it was like, I think Dave or Billy used the word, a kind of a blush with sherry wine. So it just gets did it for about 10 weeks, I think 70 days finish. So, you know, if you compare that to Lustau edition, for example, which was a year plus a, a year over, this is quite short. But what they've done by doing that sort of 70 day finish is just give it the right, you know, sherry wine contribution. Um, so what you have, what you finished up with is a cast strength. Um, it's, I think it's probably, probably 56% or something like that. You have the bottle there. Um, so you, cast strength, um, 58, 7. 58, 58, okay. Um, 58, 7. 58, 7. So it's cast strength. Um, you still have those. I tasted it last week with, 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 with Dave. And what you have is those sort of dry fruits, which are reminiscent of red breast. But what you have then is this heightened level of other fruits like, uh, you know, cherries, black currants. It's a real fruit. But at the same time, and Billy and Dave are really careful to get that balance right with the, you know, the vanilla. So you have the dried fruits, you have these sort of fleshy fruits, you have the vanilla and you have the, the oak and it all comes together. So look, they've done a great job and, you, you know, you're very fortunate to, to have, a, a, I suppose, a, a small batch I, over in America to keep to yourselves. I got lucky on that one. And yes, uh, we're, we're lucky to have that one. And uh, yeah. as uh, Dave points out, yes, it does us all good to hear somebody going nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm kidding of course but uh, you guys get bottles over in Europe that we'll never see now Dave Kuhn has a good question for you Stuart the Allardis bottles I believe are Glendronix right yep were the the ones that were bottled before 2020 he wants to know if it's true those actually contain a slightly older whiskey considering the mothballing that's something that's being thrown around on certain whiskey forums by uh, people who uh, like to say that they have some inside information what's the truth on this yeah i think again it's quite it's not really a secret it's just something we've never really promoted but if you look at the when we bought the distillery in 2009 uh, 2008 you know we, we got great infantry there and i think the ambition that we wanted to do back then was was bring back to life the core range you know when we bought the distillery itself you only had the 12 and an old 33 that was your options from uh, glendronach back then so what we want to do is create that old core again, going back to the old 15, going back to the old 18, making sure we could build that family on the shelf. And again, you're right, the distillery being shut between 96 and 2002. I always say when people ask me that, because we don't have to be a rocket scientist to, 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 to understand that, you know. If the distillery wasn't open, we weren't making anything. So you just do the math. And yes, we had to dip into older stock. So the, the ambition really was, 
was okay you're getting good whiskey for uh, there but what we want to do is get that family back in the shelf that was the first thing we wanted to do and, and continue that family so, and again age statements have you know morphed around the around the availability um age statements are always that. somewhat fungible they can uh, yeah. they can vary a little bit as long as you don't go claim it's actually older than it really is no, that's right. That's right. And again, it was something we don't shout about, but, you know, most people who look at the distilleries period, opening periods will obviously do that little bit of math and, and it'll give you the answer. <laughs> Question from Charles Epperson. For both of you, do you have any favorite American whiskeys? Uh, any that you particularly enjoy? I'm really hooked on. I, I love all American whiskeys. I really do. I've got, I've got a sweeter tooth. So I like a lot of the American mash bills and, and casks really fit my palate, to be honest. And what blew me away was it, the uh, Old Forester I've always loved in, it, in its in its own form. But when they started releasing that Whiskey Row series, you know, the 1898, 1910, oh, goodness, they're, they're right up my street, right up my street. There is a funky bee distillery up in um, Detroit, though, two James boys. They do the they do Johnny Smoking Gun, which is an extremely unusual uh, whiskey that I actually had a wee drama of last night. So if I was to go weird... I will go up to John, uh, up to Detroit and do some uh, Johnny Smoking Gun. Need to get over there and try that out. Uh, been, when I go to Detroit, it's usually to go over across to Windsor and go visit uh, Don Livermore at Hiram Walker, because uh, Don's an old friend and I just love going over there. But uh, how about you, Kevin? Any American whiskeys that you particularly enjoy? Yeah, I mean, I, lo I love visiting. You know, I used to up to this year go over maybe every September, October to to visit all the cooperages and, uh, you know, do some work at the forestry and all that. And I just love going to Louisville. Um, I really, really miss and uh, some good friends over there and traveling around to the various, you know, places to try different uh, bourbons and rye whiskeys. Uh, I, I, I love it there. Um, and again, you know, we, we've, uh, we've, we've some bourbon guys ourselves over there, Rabbit Hole, uh, Jefferson, um, and they're all really, really interesting. They're doing, doing fabulous work. Um, and I know the festival of their bourbon and beyond, I'm not sure it's going to head this year or not, but again, that's a great festival. I love trying out different bourbons. There's loads of them there. Mark, it's very hard to pick one, to be honest. Um, and they've all different flavor profiles and it's just wonderful to get a chance to, to try them on. Um, well, bourbon and beyond is not, is not going to happen. The music festival is not happening this year in Louisville. Um, Kentucky bourbon festival is still scheduled to take place, but, uh, we need to get you down to Texas to Firestone and Robertson, yeah. which is also yeah. part of the family now because That's right. uh, Rob Arnold was on the webcast a few weeks ago and they're doing some really good whiskeys down there too. Yeah, love, love to get over there so, love sometime, really would. And Chris Ratcliffe asks uh, for you, Kevin, a good entry point for Redbreast. He fancies his first bottle, which is a good representation of the character. Well, I think the 12 certainly is, but yeah. the 12 cask strength is good too. I think probably start off at the Redbreast 12. Um, and I, I suppose for, for people that maybe don't know Redbreast, you have, you know, it's, it, you have some American barrels, but then you have a, just a really generous slug of Oloroso Sherry uh, first fills. Um, and it just has this wonderful flavor. Um, and uh, then, you know, maybe, Maybe try cast strength if you do like like cast strength whiskeys. Maybe red breast cast strength, um, and then you know after a while you have the red breast fifteen, uh, which has um, you know more more, more refills and does a, does a different uh, different flavor profile. Um, uh, but look, you have loads of options. But I would suggest start off at red breast twelve uh, and just get those wonderful dried fruits what we call in Ireland Christmas cake or plum pudding uh, flavors. It's just so rich. Uh, try that. And Whiskey Canuck up in Montreal. I got a bottle of the Redbreast 12 this week. The Loose Dow edition is another one I like a lot. And uh, the Loose Dow edition comes from uh, barrels that were done exclusively at the Loose Dow Bodega in Hereth. And uh, Chris Ratcliffe goes, so yeah, try all of them. Yes, you should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris Radcliffe, one final question for both of you. Is there something you'd like to try that you haven't had a chance to try yet or are envious of others doing uh, different finishes, mash bills, or blends? What have you, uh, what have you, well, what, what have you seen other people try that you haven't done yet that you'd like to play with? Well, I'll jump in just a second because even as you were talking about the Irish oak, for example, 
and how that's been working. I would love to have played around with that. That I'm extremely jealous uh, on that front. Um, we've worked with wines again, going back to 2004. So I think we've not even. I keep on saying with the regulations that we have, uh, SWA. I don't think we're even scratching the surface of the flavours that we can produce within the guidelines there. So I'm quite happy we continue to, with the over 35 different you know, barrel styles we have, continue to deliver. Tequila's now on open. Uh, you know, um, do, do we start bringing some nice Herradura barrels over? Uh, possibly. Um, love to work with that. But there's, I like I like Japanese whiskey. There's, I know, I know you, you know very well Chuchibu, for example. They've done some really good cast work. I've seen one of the most fantastic cast structures there, using almost a hogshead form, but shorting it and putting in Japanese oak ends. So it's a kind of stumpy short cast, but the same diameter as a as a hoggy. You know, great, beautiful, just well thought out wood management there. We might Sir Buckley uh, would love that. He would. We could swap a bit of Scottish oak, uh, Stuart, for Irish oak. What do you think? Swap a few barrels. That would do. That would do. Up for that. <laughs> Yes, uh, Mark. We'll, uh, we'll see if we can put you two together in contact with each other and arrange that barrel swap. I get to taste it first, though. Okay, okay. <laughs> but again, I suppose the, the, the big advantage we have here is that we, the different types of woods that we can use. And I know, Mark, you've tasted them down over the years. And, um, you know, we want to continue more work on that. But, you know, so far with the chestnut, which is superb. Um, and then, you know, the cherry, which is, you know, a challenging wood to work with. But again, the, the, the end result is, you know, so different um, and pushes the boundaries. Um, and then we've acacia as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to work with those particular woods. And uh, I know Stuart would probably love to get his hands on, on some of those particular wood types. Um, and I suppose over the next few years, we're, we're just trying to try different types of woods. Some, some work and some don't work you know, between leakages and uh, porosity, you have, you have lots and lots of different issues. So there's a bit of trial and error and all this, but uh, that's sort of something that I'd like to, to keep working on over the next few years, you know. You've done a lot of that with the uh, Method and Madness range, right? Yeah, that's that, that all falls within Method and Madness um, range where we, I suppose, it's, it's it gives a scope to try different, you know, experiments and innovation. Uh, it's great fun. Um, and, you know, a lot of these experiments that we're doing in warehousing and in distillation in the micro distillery, they don't fall, I suppose, naturally into some of the other brands like, say, Redbreast or Powers or Jemison. So therefore, we need another outlet. And that's where we, we, we sort of brought in Method and Madness probably, what, five, six years ago uh, to give us, to, to allow us to use all those sort of experimentation and, you know, unusual things that we're trying in the, in the warehouse. Well, I'll tell you something you know funny, actually, because um, the last Paris Whiskey Live, I think I spent more time at the Method Mathis booth than I did at my own stand. <laughs> it was just amazing <laughs> to go through all of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this is the one I brought home from the uh, airport in Dublin, the single grain done in bourbon barrels. And amazing. you won't get a single grain anywhere else within the Middleton range within the entire Irish distillers range, except with the method in madness. And it's yeah. the only chance you get to taste the single grain you guys produce at Middleton. Yeah. That was in the uh, virgin Spanish, the uh, single grain in, in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Virgin finished in virgin Spanish oak. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was, that was really interesting because I suppose if you asked 10, 20 years ago, we just said single grain whiskey, you know, European oak, that's not really going to work. But if you push the boundaries and you try it and hey, presto, it, it, it you know, it, it will work. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, that was good. Do you know, one of the, one of the funniest finishes I've tried or, or wood management anyway, that was again an accident just because there was availability of the liquid of the, the style, but it was in Starward. I was, uh, um, visiting the boys before I was flying back from Sydney one day and it was ginger beer, a ginger beer cask. There was a, a, a big shipment of ginger beer that came up. They bought it, put it into barrel, left it seasoning there, boom, put some whiskey in after that. Amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice one. Yeah, because especially with Jameson, that would—I mean, if you'd ever had a Jameson and ginger ale, that would bring out <laughs> the or ginger beer even. That just brings out the finish in that. Um, let's see, uh, Richard Dankovic, are there any new Method and Madness releases on the horizon? I'm betting that you couldn't tell us if there were, Kevin, or if you told us you'd have to kill us or something like that. But uh, well, I, I would suspect uh, we're going to see something else in this range. It's too good yeah. not to uh, let it die out. No, no, I, no, no, no. We've we've lots. Believe you me, we've lots in the warehouse, and uh, you know, you know, uh, with the micro distillery we set up in 2015, so we've lots of different 
distillates that we have worked on and mash bills over the last number of years. I know you've tried them yourself, Mark, oats and rye and double distilled and triple distilled. So we've all, all there sort of, they're, they're all working their way in, in the warehouse at the moment. They're coming on nice. So th they're for the, the future. But what I can say is what we will have a method of madness, you know, over the coming, uh, coming few months. Uh, it's something very different. Um, it's something we're working on and, uh, yeah, it's 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 exciting. I, I can't wait for people to try it. So, yes, I can say it. There's one imminent. And uh, Ashley Penny from Dublin, have the lads any great hope that uh, last year's Dublin Whiskey Live will go ahead this year? We can only hope. No word yet. We 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 can only hope. Um, I, I, it's probably too early, but I, I suppose at some stage, Ali is going to have to make a call at at, at some point. Um, but. You know, in terms of events this year in Ireland, be it concerts or be it sporting events, it's very much up in the air. Um, you know, it's just I, I think the coming two months are going to play a huge part in, in how we get this thing under control. The numbers are still too high. Um, so I'd say maybe come April might be a better, better call then. Hopefully it will. It's, 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 it's brilliant. Hopefully it will. And until then, the best thing we can do is uh, wear the masks, social distance, and follow all the rules because, uh, yeah. yes, I know it sucks, but the sooner we, the more we do it, the sooner we can get back to uh, being together again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, well, we've gone and basically uh, wasted 75 minutes of your time tonight, guys. Thank you so much for doing this uh, late on a Friday night. And uh, Slanjava, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's I. Both of you are good friends, and uh, I value my our friendships. And uh, thank you for doing this. No problem at all. Slanch okay. Cheers, guys. Slanch it. So, uh, will me uh, say goodbye again to everyone, and let me uh, cut the. Let me just uh, say goodbye to everyone. As Watchman nine ninety nine points out, please waste my time again soon. Well, we will do that next Friday night at uh, 5 o'clock East Coast time, 10 o'clock GMT, 2200 GMT, 10 o'clock Dublin time. We'll be joined again once again by Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey founder Fawn Weaver and Master Blender Victoria Edie Butler will be my guests on the Happy Hour webcast next Friday night. Once again, 5 o'clock East Coast time, 10 p.m. Dublin UK time, also 2200 GMT. And until next week, thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Gillespie. Uh, take good care of yourselves. Be good to each other. And uh, we'll see you next week. Slanjava. <laughs>